Hey everybody, this is Alex Merced, Developer Advocate at Dremio, and welcome to this presentation of Data Lake House 101, the who, the what, and why of Data Lake Houses. The purpose of this presentation is to help have a deeper understanding of the concept and architecture of a Data Lake House. This is going to be generally more a vendor agnostic um, discussion, so I'm not going to be spending too much time naming specific technologies. Although at the end of the presentation, there will be a link to another presentation where I do go into more specific recommendations and prescriptive type uh, discussion about how you would want to implement your data lake house. But first off, who I am. I'm a developer advocate here at Dremio and um, I've worked in the web and data spaces um, you know, with, for several companies such as Janet Systems, Crossco Digital, Campus Guard, General Assembly. I've spoken at different events like Data, data Day Texas, OSA Con, P99 Cov, Data Council, uh, I host several podcasts, which we'll talk about in a moment, and I'm also the the author of several different libraries in the Python and JavaScript space, as well as a co-author on the upcoming O'Reilly Apache Iceberg, The Definitive Guide. You can get yourself an early copy by scanning that QR code right now. There are six chapters available in early release uh, for about 180 plus pages, but again, more is constantly being added as we complete the book. So check that out. It's a good read, especially um, concerning the topics we'll be talking about today. And of course, I mentioned I host several podcasts, such as Gnarly Data Waves, a weekly broadcast we do here at Dremio. Select Star from Data Lake, which is a data podcast about data lake and data lake houses that I do with my Dremio counterpart in the de developer advocacy, uh, Dipankar Mazumdar. And Data Nation, a solo podcast I do talking about just anything I want to talk about when it comes to data, uh, which is going to be a lot of data lake house stuff. You can subscribe to all these shows on Spotify and iTunes and anywhere podcasts can be found. But with that, let's get into our feature presentation, which is talking about sort of like, where are we now? So sort of like, what is the status quo? What is the problem uh, that we're solving for? Okay. And essentially, like this is generally how most data architecture works nowadays. So essentially, you have all your data sources, which could be your OLTB databases that, is, that are collecting information as different applications run, uh, you know, um, IoT sensors, log data, all sorts of different places where you may have data being generated. Okay, generally in a more transactional manner, and now you wanna move them for more analytical use cases. So typically what you would do is you would export the data from those data sources, transform it, and load it into a data lake because a data lake allows you to dump not just structured data, but unstructured data. So the data lake acts as like this big dumping ground for all your data, and then you'd have a portion of that data that, where you want to use for like BI dashboards and deeper analytics. So you move it to sort of a more of a full on analytics platform in the form of a data warehouse. So you would once again, export, transform, load that data into the data warehouse. Okay, so now you've made two copies of the data. But from the data warehouse, generally you need to distribute that data to many different business lines. So you might create multiple data marts. So think of it as like a data warehouse in your data warehouse, okay? But for a specific group of people. And when you're curating those data marts, you might make an additional copy of some of this data. You also might include logical views, which aren't copies, but you also might include physical copies of the data. And then from the data mart, the people who are actually using the data mart to do their analytics, they might not find the data that's there fast enough because the data is too large for their particular BI dashboard that they're building or whatever purpose they have. So what do they do is that they'll pull down the data and extract a portion of the data and create what's called BI extracts. Um, but now you're talking about data leaving the data warehouse. So now you have sort of untracked, ungoverned copies of the data. So while this has worked for a while, you run into a lot of problems. You have duplicative ETL costs every time you're trans you're moving that data and making a copy of the data. There's cost in storage and there's cost in compute. Plus any, you know, data egress costs if you're moving it between sort of storage locations and a lot of other kinds of things, okay? Um, your data warehouse, especially with, in today's world where basically the use cases for data are expanding, oftentimes one platform, they just don't grow fast enough to satisfy every single use case. They can't be everything for everything. So basically making that platform the center of your data gravity sort of basically says, okay, well, these use cases I'm good for, but there's gonna be other use cases where now I have to kind of create all sorts of really interesting workarounds so that way other tools that will satisfy those use cases 
can access it, which oftentimes results in more copies of the data. Okay. Um, yeah. So basic bottom line, what, what do we want? We want to be able to not have to duplicate the data as much. We want to be able to use all, have all the tools possible at our arsenal so that we can always use the right tool for the right use case. Okay. And in all of this, because we have less duplication, uh, we, it's going to be much easier to govern the data to prevent like regulatory fines and, and regulatory issues because we know what data is there. And we know what the rules that are governing that data um, and just make it all simpler. And this is sort of where we start moving towards a data lake house architecture. Essentially, all, what a data lake house is, is essentially a data warehouse, but deconstructed. So essentially, when you take a look at a data warehouse, a data warehouse is essentially an abstraction over several different components that allow the whole platform to kind of work in this nice, easy way for you. But the problem is because it's all abstracted away, um, you can only, you basically have to work within the parameters and the limitations of that particular data warehouse platform. In this case, the idea is you're creating your platform and basically taking your existing data lake and making it the storage component of that platform. And everything is built to operationalize that data lake. Okay, so essentially you have your data lake Okay, which is like your storage. So that could be your object storage, your Hadoop cluster, wherever all your data is being stored that you're e-tailing your data to. Okay, but then what we're going to do is we'll create a metadata layer. Okay, so you have the data layer with the actual data files and a metadata layer that's created through a table format. And basically this data layer is going to allow tools to be able to more effectively work with your data, because that's essentially what's happening in data warehouse. There's, there's your data and then there's metadata on that data that allows the warehouse to be able to perform the way it does on your data. So we're just bringing that to the data lake and saying, okay, instead of just holding data in the data lake, we'll hold metadata on the data lake that different tools can access. And that's your table format. Okay, that basically says different chunks of data, data files on your, da on your uh, data lake are a table and here's metadata on that table so you can efficiently query it. Now we need to track those tables so that we know which tables we have metadata for. And that's what the data catalog comes into. Okay. And basically all your tools would interact with that data catalog to discover your tables and where the metadata is. Okay. Um, and then you might have a semantic layer that allow you to organize, document, track that data. So that way users interact with a nice interface, a nice organization of the data in a central way. And you'll have query engines that actually query the data, okay? That actually, you know, access that metadata, plan queries on that data, and then scan the actual data files based on the plans they create through the metadata layer, okay? So essentially what we're doing is we're just implementing these additional pieces on top of the data lake that allows, when it's all said and done, once you put all these pieces together, you get pretty much what the data warehouse was giving you in the first place, okay? It's, again, a data warehouse deconstructed. And the beauty of this is you don't have to create additional copies of your data. You're just working with that one copy of your data in your data lake. So lower storage costs, lower compute costs from all the additional ETL you won't have to do. Okay, that metadata layer, okay, enables the things that data warehouses could do on your data lake, such as asset transactions, time travel, which is going to enable also disaster recovery and things like that. And catalogs make the data portable among the different tool, okay, because now, not only do you have all these tables that can now have sort of a robust set of operations done on them. Um, so that way it's pretty much like your data lake is your database or data warehouse. Um, but you can bring, you don't have to use one set of compute tools. Okay. You can use tool A today, use tool B tomorrow. You can use whatever tool sort of works best for the job you need. So you have that flexibility to use the right tool for the right use case without having to create many dupli duplication, uh, many duplicate copies of your data for each platform and all the costs that would come with that. Okay, so overall you get this nice, more robust platform, especially for like large data use cases with very expansive numbers of use cases for that data. Okay, so basically when you build your lake house, it's a bunch of pieces that when, you're const when you put them together, okay, so essentially the idea is that you kind of have a modular, like a Lego set, you piece together your data warehouse on top of your data lake. So what are the pieces that we have to put together? Okay. Well, we have to save the actual raw data in some sort of format. So this could be like a parquet, an ORC, an Avro. Okay, you're gonna actually have data files that hold actual data and you're gonna need to store them somewhere. So you're gonna need a data storage location. 
this is typically what we refer to as your data lake. Okay, the actual storage component. So this could be um, like a object storage, this could be a Hadoop cluster, wherever. But then in that data storage, not only are you gonna have the data files, but you're also going to have a metadata that allows tools to better understand which data files together make up an individual data set. And that's what the table format is. So a table format's gonna say, okay, these X files are a single table. Here's some metadata, so that way you can more efficiently say, hey, which files do you really need to scan and whatnot, okay? So those are sort of three choices you have to make. Hey, which table format are we gonna use as our metadata layer? What kind of format are we gonna save our data in and where are we physically gonna store that data? Okay, then we're gonna want a semantic layer, which is really made up of sort of three parts. There is the catalog piece, like the part that says, okay, hey, these are the tables that exist in my data lake house, okay? So that way different tools can discover them. They don't have to be like, I, you know, I don't have to imperatively sit there and say, hey, this is the table over here. I can just bring up this catalog and it knows all my tables. Um, the semantic layer brings along sort of governance rules. So not only can I see what tables are available, but I know who has access to them and I'm able to delegate access to those tables to the right people and the right level of access and discovery and audibility tools. So basically tools to help me search my data set, uh, documentation to help me understand my different data sets. Okay, transaction logs, okay, as far as what's going on in the catalog to be better, I'll be able to audit what's going on with my data, uh, lineage, views, things like that. So basically the semantic layer is gonna basically provide this sort of ease of use where basically when you put the semantic layer on top of these first three, Basically, this sort of becomes sort of your interface, your interface of your like like a normal database where you just see a bunch of tables that you may or may not have access to, and you can query them, okay, and you can easily find them, okay. So your semantic layer just makes it easier to access and understand, and discover the data in your data lake house. So then your query engines can then basically the user would be able to better understand what they want to query from the semantic layer. The query engine can discover that table and find the find that table through the data catalog in your semantic layer or through your data catalog, which then allows it to find the metadata in your table format, which it can then use to plan and say, hey, these are the different data files I need to access for this particular query, which are all stored in your data storage. So once you have all these components, you have all the pieces you need. And again, then the query engine can then deliver that data to your favorite notebook or your da favorite data application or your favorite BI dashboard, uh, you know, delivers it to the next level who needs that data. Because now that the data has been processed, then the data can then be interpreted, displayed by your favorite tools. But these are the kind of components you need to choose when you're architecting your data lake house. Okay, now there is a distinction between an open lake house and a closed lake house because a lake house is just the architecture. Basically the idea that, hey, I'm gonna use my data lake as sort of the storage layer of my data warehouse. And I'm gonna kind of implement all the other pieces that kind of have this deconstructed warehouse with my data lake at the center. But again, depending on what you choose as far as all those components, you may end up in a situation where those components rely on particular vendors, okay? And you end up in a problem that you had before with data warehouse platforms where you have vendor lock-in, where basically now parts of your data architecture are too dependent on a particular vendor that you can't really move from because there aren't necessarily equivalent alternatives. Um, so you end up sort of having to pay that bill no matter how big that bill gets. You don't have any kind of escape hatch. So an open lake house, the idea is, you know, if you're gonna embrace this new architecture and say, hey, I want my data open to all these tools. Well, you sh you're gonna want that across all the layers, okay? You, you don't want to have like a data catalog where if you're not happy with a vendor, you can't then just jump on and manage your own data catalog because the particular catalog implementation you're using isn't open source. Um, you don't want to use a particular table format where pretty much all the services needed to really optimally run that format, like uh, data optimization services, data management services, data cleanup services, are really only provided by sort of one vendor, okay? Um, so that way you have no alternatives if you're not happy with a particular vendor, okay? You want sort of components that are generally open source, and then those open source projects should be very community driven or many vendors and many, there's many stakeholders in the project contributing to the project. So that way, um, one, you don't end up having sort of a, 
a takeover by sort of one vendor that kind of controls the space and the evolution of the project. And to, you know, you end up with a more variety of vendors you can choose from to prevent yourself from getting getting, getting into those lock-ins and getting in those sort of cost creeps that can occur. So essentially, like, there's the architecture of a data lake house, but then based on those components can determine the level of openness of that lake house that will protect you from some sort of from cost creep in the future. So when I say open lake house, that's what I mean versus like a closed lake house versus where, hey, you choose components that say, okay, well, I've chosen this particular catalog. There is no open source implementation of that catalog. So I'm, you know, I am subject to the whims of that particular vendor. Or you choose a table format where all the data optimization services, all the really fancy features are all housed in the tools of one particular vendor. So even if other tools can't query it, um, I really still need to use that vendor in order for me to really get the bang out of my, the bang for my buck for this particular data table format. These kind of things are things you should be thinking about. But with that, again, my name is Alex Brissett and thank you for coming to this presentation. Okay, and I just wanna make sure that if you want to learn more, here are two things I would like you to cast your attention to. So the first one is that when I mentioned that it's going to be a more prescriptive presentation where I'll talk about specific components for each of these um, parts of a data lake house and why I think they may be a optimal choice for implementing a data lake house and what that data lake house structure would look like. Okay, in this presentation, I talk about the idea of data ops, about making a quality of your code, of your data, on your data lake. So it's basically now a lot of those data quality practices you may have been practicing on the data warehouse will have to move to the data lake house. Now, what does that look like? What tools do you use? What components enable that? We talk about that in that presentation. So check out these two presentations. Again, my name is Alex Merced, developer advocate at Dremio. I hope you enjoy this presentation. Have a great day and enjoy.